I know Rex is going to find the presentation in a bit, so I won't worry about it, yeah? yeah? Or if not, somebody else will, because if I touch machines, they break. I'm just giving you warning. So I'm not allowed to touch them in this building because they discovered that to their cost. Uh, morning, everybody, and thank you for um, inviting me to be part of this day. Um, I, I, it's fair to say that I have a bias in that um, I have huge respect for the CCQI and all the clinical networks. Uh, and I can say this whilst Claire's not in the room. Uh, we've got the best clinical networks and CCQI equivalent department of all the colleges, but I'm biased, but I believe it to be true. Um, uh, and I'm very happy to sell enabling environments. Um, uh, and uh, you'll see from the PowerPoint when Rex does put it up later on that, it's that um, I've been selling it in Hong Kong as well. And the other thing I like to sell is, is a um, RC site publication called Intelligent Kindness. And if you blend CCQI with Intelligent Kindness, then we might all um, be able to be what we'd actually like to be in the workplace and what we'd like to be when we go home at night and when we go out to play and our family life. And that's to be respected and valued as human beings. So you come from a very wide spectrum of organisations today. Uh, and uh, we, we've all got different language, whether it's um, patients, users, consumers, clients. Um, but I like to think that what we're dealing with is human beings. And where we deal with them is in the space between each human being. Uh, and that's why I think enabling environments are so important. So um, what I'm going to try and do, because I, I know that Claire's going to talk about um, care and compassion. And one of the problems with these words like care and compassion um, and I am being recorded, and I am a civil servant, but I'll take a risk, is that once a politician adopts a word, it sort of starts to debase the meaning. That, that's probably me, lost my job at HE, but I'll risk it. Um, so what I want to do is to, is to look at the whole population and the world of work. I then want to move into where we are, because the reason we want to be in part of an enabling environment, if we're in the business of working with other people, who have mental health problems or in distress or, or need help and intervention is that we want to help. Um, so I'll home in into, into what we, we sort of drew out of the Francis report. Then I'll go on to talk about intelligent kindness and then I've got a few pictures to put up when Rex decides to do it. If, 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 he will respond that about the fifth reminder, I think, being psychoanalytically inclined, you do have to revisit it with him. Okay. <laughs> So, um, just to let you know, um, if we look at the whole population, and I think maybe um, Claire and I are doctors, and I think one thing, we and many other people in this room, and I'm glad to see so many forensic colleagues, um, we sometimes um, do always think about the individual, but we do have to consider populations. So, the figures tell us from 2013 that there were an estimated 428,000 cases of work-related stress, depression and anxiety in Great Britain in 2011 and 12. Well, I think that's probably the grossest underestimate of anything you could ever come across. And of course, we're not quite sure what those figures are in, in the great public workforce that is the same size as the army in China, i.e. the public health sector and health. Uh, and then you spread across into the voluntary sector. So, um, in, in real terms, in economic terms, which obviously is interest, in, interest to government, there's a total of 10.4 million working days lost. Studies have looked at the specific factors behind work-related stress and how they're related to mental health. And it's important to emphasise that stress in this context is not simply saying someone has a large workload. High demands can be a good thing, motivating people and enhancing performance. And I know I don't perform unless I've got a high demand. I know that I burn a lot better on high demand. So stress comes from the combination of high demands with factors over, I think some of the words that came out from both sides of the audience um, is that lack, uh, where you have lack of control over your own circumstances, lack in involvement in decision making or lack of the opportunity to use your skills, and that's something very relevant to the work I'm going to be doing in Health Education England because I think there's a risk that, that sometimes we think we're not skilled up but even more frustrating is when we're skilled up and we go back into our environment and we're not enabled to use those skills. I think that is very, very sort of destructive of, of human beings in the workplace. 
So the combination of low control with high demands predicts a range of illnesses, including mental health problems, irrespective of what our personal temperament is. Uh, I didn't realise for a long time that I'm blessed with a resilient temperament. I, I didn't, that didn't dawn on me probably till about three or four years ago. But we know that the big area across the workforce is lack of appropriate support from supervisors or colleagues, such as a lack of ability to talk about work-related problems with managers and colleagues, or receiving inconsistent information from a line manager. So I think my bet noir, and I have to say I, I work in a, a very good mental health trust, but I do have one bet noir. I'm trying to get on and mind my own business and cope with the IT system. And some red flag comes up telling me I've got to read policy 35A, subsection 2, otherwise I can't carry on with what I'm doing. I think there are better ways of communicating. So lack of support and inconsistent information from supervisors are associated with a twofold increased risk of poor mental health, whereas good levels of support have a protective effect on mental health and reduce sickness absence. So, um, I, I, so I think we, we can learn a lot, and there's a huge literature on what goes out on the big wide world in the whole world of work. Um, there are standards, those of you working in managerial executive positions in your organisation know that you have to conform with the health and safety executive legislation from 2004. And we know that, well, do we know that there were nice guidelines in 2009? How many of you know that there were guidelines about how you work in, the, what the workplace should offer to those who work in it? So it's probably worth you all looking on, on, the, on the website. And there's nothing surprising in it. Um, it, it doesn't operationalise it, that's always the problem. You can always get the right words, but it's, it's the how-to in practice. Promoting a management style that encourages participation, delegation, instructive feedback, mentoring and coaching. And then it goes on for there with about nine or ten point, uh, points to it. And you can become chartered and you can become investors in people. Uh, and I'm not knocking that. But, but so we know that there's a lot going on in the world of work on the whole. So if I drill that down into um, really what I think this is about, I mean, yes, we want to be in an enabling environment, and the prime reason for that is we want to be able to deliver best for those that we're privileged to look after and, and work with in partnership. And um, we're all very familiar, whether we come from the voluntary sector, the independent sector, or wherever, of the Francis Report. And our college was the last college to do a response to the Francis Report because I thought we should take our time over it because there was a lot to learn. Uh, and we came up with five mantras, always put patients first, prioritise patient safety and well-being. But we did have that, that we needed to actually help and support the staff in the organisations. Uh, and when I started looking at, at the sort of Francis lessons, and of course in mental health, ours was Winterbourne View, Responses to inadequate or abusive practice tend to emphasise the practical, eth ethical or moral failings of individuals. And one of the things I want to look at at HEE is in the training of, of I am a doctor, so I'll talk about what I know, doctors, young doctors. And there's something really quite counterintuitive. You see these bright-eyed, brilliant, bushy-tailed human beings come for interview to medical school, and by year five in medical school, you've knocked it out of them. And I just don't understand how we do that. How can you possibly do that? And I can see some nodding, because I don't think it's dissimilar in other trainings, wh whatever sector, whatever profession you're in. Um, and so much is just put into a course. Oh, well, ethics and morals, well, just stick that in a box. And my biggest fear is there'll be a training box for care and compassion. Now, if there becomes a training box for care and compassion with a KPI at board level, you might as well bury care and compassion in, in, into a coffin because that is not the way to do it. I understand the needs of boards of any organisation and the things they have to fulfil to get the money in. I'm, I'm not naive. But these standalone statements will not deliver patient-centred, compassionate care. Um, uh, and I think it's worth just hesitating slightly um, and talking about duty of candour. So duty of candour was something that was sadly lacking in, in mid-staffs and, and wasn't even thought of in Winterbourne view. Uh, and drilling down to what duty of candour is, is actually about communicating one human being to another. And I'll show a, a, um, a PowerPoint about that later on when Rex puts the PowerPoint up. <laughs> <laughs> or he gets somebody else to do it. I'm, I'm now trying to help. I'm trying to enable now. <laughs> uh, 
Um, if we look at BBC's Winterbourne View television programme, I, I, and some this gave rise to offence when I put this in our report from the <coughs> college, but it didn't arise primarily as a consequence of placing vulnerable people with challenging... It, it arose because we put vulnerable people with challenging behaviours in the care of ordinary people in a closed environment. Now, I think a word that's deeply debased is ordinary. I strive to be ordinary because being ordinary is really great. And yet we're so obsessed in, in today's society with celeb and what's labelled as extraordinary. Well, you can be extraordinary for one reason one day and for another the next day. Uh, and hence one of the safety health warnings that should go with uh, tweeting after what happened last night. So I won't mention white bands or flags because I might have to resign. So the primary failing at Winterbourne View was not failure to recognise that abuse was going on. As awful as it was, that was a secondary failing. It was the failure to recognise that such behaviour was highly likely to arise in that setting unless active steps were taken to prevent it. And I think the same lessons sat in, in mid-staffs. Um, where I, I thought Francis didn't go far enough and where I, I, I wonder whether the new commission being run by a surgeon and the chief exec at Salford Acute Trust may not quite get it is, is what really human factors are about. So Francis recognises the unhelpful nature of a blame culture. But for him, systemic factors seem to be administrative rather than about psychosocial relationships. Uh, and, and in talking about psychosocial, uh, psychosocial resilience, these relationships are in the space between those that we're trying to have relationships with. Uh, and it's understanding um, group and institutional dynamics, and that's why I think enabling environments are so important. So I think what was missing from the Francis report was a psychological perspective. And I think that's the gap that enabling environments fills. What is required to prevent poor practice is the setting up of proper systems of supervision, understanding pressures staff are experiencing, taking action when things go a bit wrong rather than waiting till they're very wrong, and making patient feedback a key indicator of performance. So compassion and care, which is why I took the job at HEE, because I think people are a bit surprised I do, because I'm not a born civil servant, um, is about education and professional responsibilities for self-care. And that is going to be a big task for me um, within the HEE role. <coughs> so what I want to move on to, um, and I will need the PowerPoints very shortly. He's ready, I can see it. Um, I want to take something out of Intelligent Kindness. And I could have chosen any of the chapters in Intelligent Kindness because if you put Intelligent Kindness with enabling environments <coughs> and how you truly, truly value users of service, services as equal partners, you have the triangle. If you have that triangle, then I believe that things will go well. But the chapter I've chosen to look at is Chapter 4. And the reason for this is like those of you who work in secure environments, I've, I've spent more hours locked up than most people who've served a double life sentence. I started my secure sentence in Strangeways Prison. I was largely blamed for the riots because four of the young people on the roof had been decamped from Hindley in the YOI where they'd been too naughty. And they ended up going from the roof on Hindley to the roof in Strangeways. And because I was looking after them, Lord Justice Wolfe thought it was my fault. I thought that was a bit harsh of him, uh, and, uh, but th there you go. And that taught me a lot about being blamed. So managing feelings of love and hate, I think, because um, I think if you work in a secure environment, um, you're paid money to look after people that are demonised by the outside world and who have learnt as a sort of defence to throw at you the sort of worst forms of behaviour that anybody could ever fantasise about. So it's not an easy task. Uh, and another book I'd commend to you is that by Jim Rose, which is about working with children in secure care. And it's called From Chaos to Culture, which again, I think, is what enabling environments are about. Because I think in many organisations, we live in free floating anxiety with brown paper packages that we hope won't land on our lap this week, but will land on somebody else's. Uh, and part of the un under getting under the skin of this is managing feelings of love and hate. 
And in the book that this married couple wrote, which is John Ballett and Penelope Campling, and I'll leave you to work out who's the analyst and who's the hospital manager. Um, in this chapter, they start off by saying, there is nothing heavier than compassion. Not even one's own pain weighs so heavy as the pain one feels for someone else. Pain intensified by the imagination and prolonged by a hundred echoes. Uh, it's a quote from the unbearable lightness of being. And they talk about what's happened in the culture with the KPIs and the tick boxes and the, me and, and the measuring of things, a pull away from kindness. And they look at, again from their perspective about how seemingly caring people behave unkindly. So how do good staff become bad? Uh, and this is a theme throughout the whole of their book. And uh, I haven't got time to go into depth into the chapter, but I think if you start to look at some of the headings in the chapter, it's it, and, and you think about your position in any organisation. I was just talking to Adrian before we began, and, and I think there ought to be a, a sort of spin-off of in enabling environments, and I think that ought to be a day course given to board members of any organisation, to trustees. Because if they don't get it at that level, it will never be adopted at all the other levels. I've been asked to talk about from the ground up. The ground up know what the, I hate this word, issues, tissues are, but it's got to be understood at board level. And, and I think it's a bit, you know, this sort of business management pictures you get. I, I, sorry, I was a reluctant leader. I refused to go on a business management course. So they found me a course at Manchester Business School, which was run by the emeritus professor of being awkward. He was a professor of business management and he had us all, we're all recalcitrant, and he called the course How to Beat the Bastards. So he got <laughs> us into the mindset and then he coaxed us round saying this is the wrong attitude. But many of you are old enough will remember that sort of visual picture that was then on acetate of a triangle which was a series <laughs> of pigeons crapping on each other and, and the ground force, the workforce felt most crapped on. Well actually it was the middle managers who were getting it both ways. And I actually think the key people within enabling environments are these, pe if even the name's derogatory, middle managers. Well, what are they? Failed clinicians or not going to get to board level, not going to be CEOs. And there's all these stereotypes about middle managers, but they are actually the linchpin to how this will work. So I've probably insulted everybody now. <laughs> I haven't yet sworn, because um, I was a bit reluctant when they said it's videoing, because I do have a habit of swearing, which... which um, you know, if my grandchildren saw this, it would be not good, would it? So the authors go on to talk about the wounded healer, and this is why I'd have to go over to Rex, because it all gets too analytical for me. Intrinsic horrors and anxiety. The relationship with the work one does is not fixed, and there is the potential for many types of experience along the way to push one to behave in an unkind manner or get, get stuck in an unkind state of mind. And I think that's what happens in closed institutions. We get stuck in a unkind state of mind. It, uh, the one thing, and another thing I like about what they talk about is engaging with ill-being. And they say in ill-being is a state of complex unease. Now just think about it. When you go through, you, you go through, you go through various cycles of complex um, unease. A, will the alarm clock go off in the morning? B, will one of the kids have a temperature that Calpol won't bring down, so I'm going to have a childcare problem. So you have all that domestic unease before you get to work, and then you come through the door and you pick up a new set of, of sort of complex unease. And I think it's a good description. Um, a person may find it hard to name, evaluate, to express the basic symptoms of an illness. And this is not just the illness of the person we're trying to help, but actually the dis-ease that we experience. And I believe disease, I'm a doctor, I believe in disease, I believe in classification, I believe in diagnosis. But I leave what comes through the front door, particularly to see Claire in a general practice, is a person's dis-ease. And I believe what grows in environments that are not enabling is dis-ease. And of course, if you leave it to linger, it gets infected, sepsis sets in, and it becomes a disease. I won't dare to talk about psychological defence mechanisms in front of wrecks because then I think I would lose the plot. I think there is the risk, and I think it's a particular risk working in, in the field of mental health, whether in the voluntary sector, of over-identification. My wonderful son-in-law runs a gangs project in Manchester, uh, and he's, he's, he, he's totally ignorant of anything to do with mental health. 
he, I've got his permission to say this, he's totally insightless to the fact that he definitely had ADHD as a child and as an adult it's what gives him his creativity. So he's not hampered by knowledge. So he sees whatever comes through the door as a human being coming through the door, what can I do to support them and help them? And in a way, that, that, that is a great sort of knowledge base to have, that you're not hampered by knowledge, because we do need knowledge. So over-identification is something. Um, we're very good, and I think we're particularly good in mental health. In fact, I think we've got a higher PhD in it. I mean, we, we absolutely major in guilt and self-blame and shame. I mean, if, if there was an award for it, we'd get the award every year. Uh, and sometimes this is sort of fostered by our, our colleagues in the rest of medicine. But we really do have to get over ourselves. But I think the key thing is to how to manage our feelings of anger and hatred sometimes towards, towards other peers who are, are, are staff and to sometimes towards those we're caring for. Um, I, I'm a child psychiatrist, so I have to mention um, Donald Winnicott. And this is, you, you're going to feel uncomfortable what I'm going to say next because this goes to the heart of being ordinary, which is what we should strive for. And what we need to be in work and in an enabling environment is good enough. And yet all these targets drive us to some nirvana of excellence that won't work. Perfect example was the Ofsted inspection today in Tower Hamlets. So we're getting fantastic scores on the doors with their results. Then something comes from left field, uh, which was about um, faith, misinterpretation of faith, and was there movements so emerging in schools. And suddenly their Ofsted rating plummets because the top of the tree have changed the criteria. Uh, and uh, so things are very sort of transient, aren't they? So being good enough rather than perfect is fine. And you can take a leaf out of the work of, of what we look for in, in all of us working with children. What we're looking for is not perfect parents, God forbid, but good enough parenting. Uh, and I think we're, we fight shy of that because CQC have adopted these Ofsted ratings, haven't they? And, and yet, you know, it's setting us up to fail. So I've probably insulted all um, four bits of the quango. So now I need the PowerPoint. <laughs> What's it called? Uh, she put it on there. You might have to get help. I, c I can carry on without the PowerPoint. Um, she did put it there. No. Okay, I'll just keep I'll going. Just I just want you to see the pictures, basically. It's not the words. Um, yeah, uh, yes, you got it there. There was a frog. Did you see the frog? Frog. Yeah, was it a frog? No, 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 that's you. No, sorry, no, I saw a frog. <laughs> see, you can be deluded into what you're seeing, can't you? Okay. No, okay, I'll carry on. Um, I, I just want to look at some of the things. Um, this is a presentation I took to Hong Kong, and I just, just want to get to some of what I think are the key things. Um, it, somebody said over here a positive word was innovation. Um, but there are challenges that mitigate against innovation within health services. I would like to think it's easier in the NGOs, but I'd, I'd like the NGOs to secretly tell the outsider room that it's, it's, it's as hard to innovate in the NGOs as it is in the public sector. Uh, but don't answer me loudly now, because you, you have the same systems and you're worrying about bidding for the same pot of money and everything gets blended in. And I, th I think innovation is the challenge. It's about overcoming system inertia, we have complex adaptive systems, and above all, we've become risk averse. Ah, brilliant, okay, fantastic. You see that the man can do it. So I just wanna look at some of the realities. We've got globalization and medicine. We've got a commodity of healthcare. All these things are changing. This is what we're trying to do. This is how the enabling environments are gonna have to flex within health. The impact of new technologies, which I think are great, with some caveats, changing demographics, the shift from hospital to community, continuing changes in surface configurations, and if NHS England do finally decide what, what, the, what the new service is to look like, would they tell HEE so we can plan for the education? So that's an internal sort of discussion to be had. And of course what we know in health is that increasing demand and cost pressure. That's the reality, which is what makes it difficult for a CEO of every any health organisation to function from day to day. That's what they're actually up against. So there it is. So the health service is, is you know, as the guy who first had the first job at NHS Ling said, that it is like turning the Titanic. So there is system inertia. We are complex adaptive systems and we're risk averse. 
that, you know, the frog spawn, as long as some naughty boy, sorry I've been sexist, doesn't come along and destroy the frog spawn, does this amazing journey into an adult frog. Uh, and so they can innovate, they're adaptive. Um, how long have I got, Rex? Five minutes? Ten. Ten, brilliant. Okay, that's good for me. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about things which are really around populations, people at risk of getting men mental health problems, and well, as a doctor I'll call patients, but I think it's just the same for us who are working in this sector. So there are four components towards partnerships in mental health care. And I want to talk about horizontal epidemiology. Uh, so everybody's used to long-term, longitudinal studies by which the time you publish them, they're out of date because the system's changed so much that they've lost half their meaning. So I've now annoyed every academic in the room. Psychosocial care, which I think is a, a much un underestimated. I mean, if anybody thinks they're going to improve their outcomes in hernia operations without taking into consideration the body with which they're doing the hernia operation on, that the fit young sportsman and the 88-year-old with chronic obstructive airways disease and nobody to look after him back in the community is naive in the extreme. Resilience, which I'm a great fan of, and social identity. Uh, and today we've got a social identity as professionals, uh, of volunteer workers, users, carers, whatever identity we bring into the room. Horizontal epidemiology recognises the quality of people's of lives, which includes those who work in health, and the circumstances in which they live. And I think that's at the heart of enabling environments. I may be wrong, and, and Rex can tell me afterwards. Psychosocial resilience was seen as a bit of a happy, clappy thing to be talking about, a bit soft and a bit flaky. But it's a science coming into its own, derived from disaster psychiatry and individual trauma. And recovery, horizontal epidemiology and psychosocial resilience turn on trying to alter the circumstances in which people relate, live and work. And unless you live on a desert island or, or, you're, you're, or you are so rich that you live in an altered world or you don't recognise that there are many houses if you travel from Manchester to London on a train that do have red flags and white bands outside them, then, then y this is what ordinary people are doing. And it's in order to provide them with the opportunity to achieve satisfying social identities and derive support from membership of networks and groups. And I think that's what you should be getting in, in the world of work or school. Social groups and identity, I, I think, are very strong. And, and I think there's much here. I would like to see those who work in the health profession not take the wonderful things they do outside work and just drop them at the front door. So I, I have got time to ask how many of you are school governors, how many of you do voluntary work, how many of you do soup kitchens, anything else that you do. And you drop that as though it's not valued and valuable, but you bring it to work with you, and I think we would be better. Uh, we, we've evolved to function in social groups, uh, and um, if you look at the work of Haslam, they're a married couple from England who now work in Australia. They've described the virtuous circle of social identity. And I think this applies as much to those who are working to help others as those we are striving to help. That if you have a sense of community, and I think that's what some of the words were about what you want in an organisation, it gives you a basis for support and coping. It gives what was said about stress in the workplace. It gives control, purpose and meaning. That leads to health. And I have trouble with the word well-being, but it's what we've got. And that circles round to a sense of community. And that's what will give trust better um, KPI marks than the neighbouring trust at the end of the day. So I think it's about social identity. Um, it's about us understanding why groups matter. It's about giving people, whether it's people we're trying to help or ourselves, the skills we need. And I think a lot of this is about social scaffolding. And important to that is the built environment. And those of you working in Secure know that if you have a poor built environment, your job is nigh impossible. Just want to say a bit about sustainability, if I've got five minutes, because I think this is very relevant. We've, we, there's a sustainability fellow in the college who's doing great work. Um, and it's just because people don't understand sustainability. And everybody thinks of low carbon technologies and reducing waste. The biggest waste is duplication of service delivery, serially assessing patients until they're sick to death of being assessed, not seeing the patient as a whole journey, um, and just wasting money. Um, but it, 
at its heart, sustainability is about disease prevention. And I'd like to see providers of services across the health promotion, prevention, primary care, secondary care, be much more brought together in the way they're organised. And I think this is something enabling environments can do. So, um, I, I was uh, 58 when I discovered what communication was about. I discovered it at a lecture being given at a conference where the commonality was that they were all people working with those who were deaf and mentally ill. And it was a speech and language therapist who taught me. So I think this should be at the heart of enabling environments. I've got five minutes. To ask for what we need. This is why do we communicate? It seems such a basic question. And medical school curricula full of learning how to communicate, you know. But I think this is what it's about. To ask for what we need, to express our likes and dislikes. And of course, if we feel oppressed, we'll start expressing our dislikes in a very unhelpful way. To express opinions, and we need to be able to do that in an enabling environment, to actually say, well, actually, you know, no, I don't think that's right, and here's my evidence for it. To ask for information, and I prefer it not to ping up on a machine when I'm busy trying to write the formulation on a patient. To respond to others' questions and instructions, to form relationships with others, to be able to express our feelings safely without them being misinterpreted or feel that they're going to be spilt out to somebody else in an inappropriate way. We do have to be organised ourselves and make plans, so anybody can tell me how to do that. I've not learnt yet, so I, you know, I, I, please let me know. And we are there to mutually support and solve problems. I can't do any presentation without talking about parity, uh, and I think enabling environments help to give parity. And I think it's absolutely tremendous that, that the enabling environments have gone out to the whole of the prison sector. I think that's really tremendous. Um, and, and I get a lot of feedback as to how much that is helping. I want to talk about quality because everybody wants to measure things and talk about quality. Uh, and I th I'd like to do an enabling environment, I'd like you to do an enabling environment training to members of parliament and to policy leaders in the DH. Uh, and I'd like you to put at the front of it to explain to them what policy is. Because policy involves elements of politics, management and advocacy. It entails leadership that sets aspirational expectations, lays them out with clarity and accountability, has to balance the ideal with the pragmatic, not simply evidence and science, but includes clinical viewpoints, patient care perspectives, economic and above all narrative perspectives. I believe the art of medicine as a doctor is listening to the story of your patient. Dealing with complexity to all levels, change management and measurement, because sadly, as much as it irritates us, you can't improve what you don't measure. And in mental health, we fail to measure things, and that's why we've got less money than other bits. So here it is. Here's the advert for en enabling environments. In the organisations that provide care and treatment, and there are some of the things there that I understand that enabling environments are about. Standards, belonging, boundaries, communication, development, involvement, safety, structure, empowerment, leadership, openness. Big words, hard to do. But cumulatively, I can see courses that contain that, but they just put them in separate boxes. But what's it about? It's about creating an ethos that's about a set of attitudes, values and behaviours. And the next clinical fellow at, at the, this college is going to be uh, somebody we've just appointed who's going to do values-based commissioning in CAM services. So I think with those three things, if they become a characteristic of a service as a whole, you've cracked it. So I'm going to finish with some pictures because I believe in ways of seeing and ways of being. Uh, I'm a great fan of Ai Weiwei. Um, I was privileged to meet with him. I go to Hong Kong quite a lot. And literally over there, art students literally do sit at the feet of the master. And they sit and they contemplate and they have, dis have time to di discuss. So the art of science um, is ways of seeing and ways of being. Uh, that's the cynic's view of politicians. Um, this is actually a graffiti under the Elephant and Castle under Skipton House. I don't suppose any minister has ever seen it. But I think sometimes it does sum up how both patients and us as workers feel. The smile says one thing, but the actions say something different. People live in society, they don't live in mental health services, and people who work in health are human beings who have whole lives, not part lives. Uh, and anybody who thinks that uh, their work p p position is, is, is perfect and they spend seven days a week there, come and see me, you desperately need help. <laughs> it's on being human. 
Please do not feed the humans. And sometimes I think that's how we feel. System malfunction, well, um, certainly you can only cope with so much stress and change in an organisation. Then you do go into system malfunction and then you become high risk to others. This site is managed and maintained by Blank Expression. I'll leave you to apply that to whom you feel it best fits. And uh, as in life, I've got a lot of time for the CEO of Apple. Skate to where the pup will be, not where it has been. Um, and um, because I'm a child psychiatrist and I chair a children's charity, uh, I like to see this picture. It's, you can tell that they belong to the same species. Uh, they're not all looking in the same direction, so there's been a bit of a row over the breakfast table. And they all come in different colours and sizes. Uh, uh, and that sums up the family of health. Um, so um, just want to say, I think, we, I think what enabling environments do is they are skirting where the pup will be, not where it has languished and languished and festered for too long. So I hope I've sold enabling environments. I don't feel I need to because I feel they sell themselves. And if you have been, thank you for listening.